Just what are the major vulnerabilities of the Chinese communist economic system? Can we trust the financial numbers coming out of China? Why is the Chinese economy so dependent on US dollars? And what are the broader implications of this? And how do Hong Kong and the Hong Kong protests fit into China's economic and political future? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellek. Today we sit down with Kyle Bass, the founder and chief investment officer of the Heyman Capital Management Hedge Fund and a founding member of the Committee on the Present Danger, China. We discuss the implications of China's massive credit to GDP ratio, communist China's non-performing loans and culture of bribery, the role of Wall Street in the US-China trade relationship, and Kyle Bass's thoughts on the future. Kyle Bass, really great to have you on American Thought Leaders. Great to be here. So Kyle, you are the principal of Heyman Capital. Um, and you've been doing a lot of work in Asia. And I think uh, you've been actually studying the Chinese monetary system for is it a, a decade? About a decade, yeah. Okay. And so I, I want to talk about that. It works very differently over there than it does here. Mm -hmm. And it's also very opaque, deliberately. And, but you've actually learned quite a bit through trial and error, through research and so forth. Tell me a little bit about what's going on in China. Sure, so for your audience here at, uh, at the Epoch Times, I think it's important to just stay, stay high level. And um, what you have to understand about China is they, they run two completely different systems. One is the system internally. How many times have you heard, oh, well, China's banking system is gonna collapse or Chinese companies are gonna collapse because they're too levered. And then someone responds to you, but they're China. They can do whatever they want. That's true internally. So they, their system internally, they control the printing press, the price level, the police, and the narrative. They control everything. And so those RMB or yuan that they print uh, and, and expand their central bank balance sheet, they can do a lot of things. Uh, they can put off the Grim Reaper for a long time. Okay. The other side of China is they have to interface with the rest of the world. And the rest of the world won't take their monopoly money. Right, as you've seen, they've tried to price oil in RMB with MBS and MBZ in the UAE and Saudi, and no, one, no one's really subscribing to this ID, uh, ideology because no one can spend RMB. Um, so it's important to understand that when they interface with uh, the Middle East or the West, they have to interface in dollars, euros, yen, or pounds, mostly dollars, about 80% dollars. Okay. And so they have a desperate need for dollars. And so when you understand China's MO, it's to keep their domestic financial system stitched together and to try to cajole, arrange, borrow, steal dollars. Uh, that's, that is what their international MO is. And so uh, once you understand those two things, then you can dig in and understand, it, right? When you, when you understand someone's intent or more importantly, their motivations, then you can understand the system a little better. Uh, so when you understand the way it works, then you can understand exactly how their system works. Okay, so, so in a nutshell, what is the motivation? So look, their motivation is to maintain a closed capital account. Uh, and I know that that's, that's an economic term, but to put that into perspective, they, in theory, they represent 15% of global GDP. They're the second largest right, country in the world behind the U.S. at 25%. And yet, less than 1% of global transactions that are cross-border transactions settle in their currency. So, okay. so we just buy their narrative. We just say, OK, well, I guess your currency is worth what you say it's worth. I guess, um, I guess we will allow you. So their, their motive, their desire is to invest in the West, um, the money that they earn from the West, but to maintain their closed system, to maintain their authoritarian rule in China, and to never uh, westernize or open up or become a liberal democracy like we have hoped they would for the last 20 years. So, okay, maybe you can comment on something. I've often said to people, I've said, you know, you remember what happened with respect to stimulus in America in 2008, that, that, that time period. E everyone knew that at some point you have to pay the piper, so to speak, right? You can do stimulus. Uh, our, our sense from a lot of work we've done is that China did that kind of thing, but just even at a much grander scale. Correct. And I'm wondering if you could actually speak to that. Sure. Yeah. 
So uh, when, when you grow a credit system much faster than you grow GDP, which is what China has done, especially from 2008, they expanded their, their banking system assets, or let's say the amount of credit in their system, expanded 50% of the size of their entire GDP every year for five years. That would be the same as the US, so it's the US is about a $20 trillion economy. Imagine if we lent $10 trillion into our economy in one year. Our what, economy what, what, what would, do we do? It would, it, would, it would explode up multiple double digits. But then we would have a massive hangover. We'd have a lot of loans that go bad, and we'd have to restructure them. In China, in our, in our office, we say uh, a rolling loan gathers no loss, right? It's an adaptation of, uh, of a much okay. older saying. Uh, but it's important to think about Chinese credit is now growing because there's no cash receipts. The re there's very little money coming in to pay these loans off, so they just grow the loans, if you follow me. Yes. Uh, and so when you look at Chinese credit growth every January, a large part of that credit growth is just the loans from the year before not being paid and growing. That's absolutely fascinating. And just for comparison, you know, you said 10 trillion, imagine growing $10 trillion in a year. What, is the, what does the U.S. do for comparison? To, oh, I mean, yeah. we, we grow our credit system about the size of our, G, uh, our GDP growth, call it 2 or 3% okay. a year. So today, we have 20 trillion of GDP and about 20 trillion of credit. It's a one-to-one -one relationship, uh, 20 trillion of banking assets. In China, they have about, I'm going to use dollars and not yuan. Yeah. Uh, they have about $13 trillion at today's exchange rates in GDP. Remember, U.S. has 20, China's at 13. Mm -hmm. They have $55 trillion worth of credit in their system. Mind you, we have the most advanced, largest economy in the world. We have 20. They have 55. And from what we understand, a lot of those, a lot of the loans, especially internally, will ultimately default or are going to be non-performing. Sure. So. The IMF has even publicly said they think the, the number of non-performing loans exceeds 7% of assets. Um, China claims it's one. Mm -hmm. uh, we think it's more like 20, 25. And to put it in perspective, in the Asian financial crisis, so 98, 2001, 2002, about 35% of Chinese loans went bad and they had to restructure their banking system. And Wang Shishan was the, actually the chief economist at the time restructuring the Chinese banks, okay. 2001, 2, 3. So if a third of the Chinese loans go bad, we're talking about 15, 16 trillion dollars worth of loans going bad. Just think about this for a second. They, <laughs> on, they only have two trillion of equity in their system. And so, to, again, to put it in perspective, in the US financial crisis, our entire banking sector lost about $800 billion, and we recapitalized it. Right. Okay? I'm telling you that there is, China's gonna lose at least $3 trillion, if not $5 trillion, in their collapse. Okay, so now you're, you're talking about the, uh, uh, economic collapse, which... Uh... Let me refine that, just yeah. say recession. The first recession okay. they have, they're gonna have a real problem. Okay, and so and you're and so where when is that coming? <laughs> uh, you know, if I knew that, uh, you know, I'd I'd be a much wealthier man. But I think, look, uh, globally, you're seeing PMIs head to zero. Uh, you're seeing industrial production uh, trade to zero and even below. Uh, whether you're looking at Europe, China just printed the lowest number they've printed in the last 35 years, right? NIP, and the U.S. is slowing down. The U.S. is kind of the best of them all because we've re restructured our banking sector. Our credit system uh, is functioning much better than it ever has. And Europe never recapitalized their banks. And China, of course, uh, has pretended for a long time. So as the world slows down a bit, you're going to see some economies have slight recessions. I think we'll have a slight recession here next year because if the rest of the world's slowing down, there's no way the U.S. is going to grow in the face of the rest of the world. Uh, slowing down, but I think in the next global uh, cyclical downturn, China's going to have a real problem. So, you know, actually, it, I, I thought of something. I was looking at your Wikipedia page uh, mm -hmm. recently, um, and it kind of, uh, uh, it, it, the, let's say the narrative on the page, it talks about, um, you know, you trying to short the yuan and failing at that. It talks about just trying to paint a picture of someone who, who it, it, 
hasn't been quite successful in their in their work with a hedge fund. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, because I want to sure. help you build your own ac acumen here. Well, first I'll you... say that no one's infallible and that, that we make plenty of mistakes uh, running our fund, just like you do in life. Uh, we try to make uh, you know better, many better investment decisions than than poor ones, and uh, we've had our shares of ups and downs. However, uh, the Wikipedia page is something that's really interesting because one of the endeavors that uh, that we engaged in many years ago was um, uh, I got together with an intellectual property lawyer who was explaining to me how big pharma uh, like to evergreen old patents. You know, patents only have a 17-year 17 17-year life. And yet, many of the drugs in the U.S. system uh, should have rolled off patent, you know, decades ago. Mm -hmm. But they keep tweaking uh, the chemical compound just a tiny bit to to renew and get a new patent. So we we raised about a billion dollars to go after uh, Big Pharma, and uh, that's when my Wikipedia page popped up. I so see. Big Pharma hired, uh, from what we heard, a little more than a hundred lobbying firms to fight us, and uh, all of a sudden. The Wikipedia page pops up and uh, populates with, you know, uh, trying to trying to make an, uh, uh, draw a negative narrative, and uh, okay. it's been a monster of its own, which has actually been really fun to watch, truthfully. So, so the, the narrative isn't right, or, or is? Oh, I mean, uh, so to to be honest, I don't think I've looked at my Wikipedia page in two years, so I just I just don't know. But two years ago, uh, it definitely wasn't right. Uh, but. Anyway, uh, I think the people that you're up against, uh, whether it's Big Pharma or China, uh, I think you know they, they have a lot of money and a lot of time. They can hire a lot of people to say many bad things about you. And so how have, how have your investments vis-a-vis -vis, you know, Hong Kong, China, the UN fared? Yeah, so in Hong Kong we're doing, well, unfortunately for the people of Hong Kong, uh, China has really overstepped its bounds, as you probably know, given the... the Hundred plus days of protests, and right. now now we're starting. I don't know if you probably saw last night where the Hong Kong police said they might have to kill someone, um, yes. which is probably going to happen. Uh, but our our investments in Hong Kong uh, are doing great uh, so far, uh, and our investments in China, we we at first you know the yuan appreciated about eight to ten percent against us, uh, and then it it depreciated ten percent, and so there was really no blood in China. Uh, Interesting. But, but you know, and and the narrative. I I don't know if the Wikipedia page uh, has the narrative in Japan, but you know, everyone thinks uh, the press thought we lost a lot of money in Japan, and that was one of my most successful ventures ever. Uh, so okay. it's funny. It's funny how uh, how the world works. So tell me a little bit about what you learned with respect to the Chinese monetary system in your actual interactions with it and research over these over this decade that you've been doing it. Yeah. So. China, as you've probably seen in the Brookings report, they overstate their GDP. We think it's roughly 2% a year on average over the last you know, 10, 15 years. So we, we think the Chinese economy is at least a quarter smaller than they say it is. Uh, and that Brookings uh, said the same, which is interesting because you know Brookings gets a lot of funding from the, from the CCP uh, in various ways. But I think, um, I think what I've learned is they supply data series to the marketplace. There's actually a lot of data in China if you know where to look. If you look at all their data repositories, uh, there are similar repositories in the U.S., like in the CEIC is the Bloomberg of China. There's plenty of data in English uh, that, they, that they produce. Now, if you find a series that they really don't like and you publish it, they'll just cancel the series, which happened in one of my uh, investor letters. Oh, tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. So in, uh, in February of 2016, I wrote uh, an investor letter to all of our investors that ended up getting published in the FT and the journal and various places because it was, a, it was a, a particularly revelatory piece because it was, this is how the Chinese system works. These are the numbers in the system as per China. And if you just use their numbers, if you actually believe their numbers, which we don't, but if you do use their numbers, their system uh, has grown at such a reckless rate that you're going to see a restructuring in their system at some point in time. And if you talk to any chief IMS, IMF chief economist, World Bank chief economist, just talk to people that are part of the establishment. Ask them if you can grow credit 50% of GDP every year and only grow GDP 10. Um, you can't do that very long before you have a comeuppance. And so what I've learned is if you use their data and believe their data, it's already pretty bad. 
but we also know that all of the majority of their data is false and, and worse than they say it is. And so that, that will increase the uh, odds of a, of a major restructuring at some point in time. The thing that's kept China going for so long, back to my first uh, mm -hmm. description about them having two worlds, is if you remember, as the U.S. allowed China to ascend in the WTO in 2001 under false pretenses, as we now know, with the expectation of them opening right. their economy, becoming more Western, becoming more liberal, becoming more uh, democratic, and they've actually gone the other way. Um, and so basically, if you look back to then, they, what we did is we exported, what, four and a half million jobs from the U.S. Rust Belt went to China, that we started uh, exporting our jobs to get cheaper t-shirts and cheaper tennis shoes and cheaper electronics. That's basically what we did. And what China did is they amassed a pile of U.S. money, four and a half trillion dollars. Right. Right. So they were the world's factory floor and they got four and a half trillion dollars and then things reversed. Right. What, what happens when you bring 400 million Chinese out of poverty into the middle class? What are the first thing these people do? Well, they travel. Well, when they travel, what are they going to spend? They're not going to spend R&B. They spend dollars. So China is short energy, food, basic materials, and now travel. They have to spend the reserves on these things to, to let them happen. So this world that they live in where they want to have a closed system, but they're kind of opening the cage and letting the birds fly a little bit. And they want the birds to come back home and they only let the birds spend a certain amount of money when they're flying around. That travel services deficit, just net travel in China, is almost $350 billion a year now. So what I'm learning is their entire MO is they have to get access to dollars. And you know, I'm here in DC with you, and uh, we'll fast forward this conversation real quick, because uh, now that they don't have a positive current account, or let's say a net amount of dollars coming in, they actually have dollars leaving net, right. What they have to do is find other sources for dollars because their labor arbitrage is gone. They're no longer the world's factory floor for all intents and purposes. Many of the areas in Southeast Asia and even Mexico are now up to Chinese income Picking levels. up the mantle, basically. Right, yeah. right. So that, that labor arbitrage is gone. And so now they need to find somewhere else. So as we all know, they steal about 200 to 500 billion dollars a year of U.S. intellectual property. And they earn a return on that. Uh, so that's one way they make money. Uh, the other way is they've, they've cajoled and coerced people like MSCI and the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index. These are big pools of capital that the globe invests in, and they've, they've convinced and coerced these people into, a, into making the Chinese representation in these indices bigger. So this is, these are American index funds, right? Both, that, a, both American yeah. and, and European, right? Okay. So with the FTSE yeah. and the yeah. Barclays Global Ag and all of those. These are, these are indices that global pension funds, global institutional investors track. If you allocate your capital and say, I want 40% in U.S. stocks, I want 20% in emerging markets, I want 10% in global bond indexes, right? If you're, if you're going to follow the endowment model, and a lot, of, a lot of endowments and pensions follow that model, yes. if you change the model, if you tweak how much China is in the EM index, then those funds have to invest the money there. And so China's figured out through, I think, the back doors how to get dollars to flow into China. And I was mentioning to you, uh, one of the meetings I had here on the Hill yesterday uh, was the Chinese securities regulators. So that basically the Chinese equivalent of the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, the CSRC in China, was here, on, here in Washington, D.C., meeting with congressmen, telling congressmen that Chinese companies don't really need audits and there's nothing to worry about there. So wait, hold the presses here. Um, Chinese companies don't need audits. And this has actually been the case forever, right? So the, our securities markets were opened up to what we deem to be emerging markets. In emerging markets, we created various levels of compliance that we require for you to list your company here. So there, these are two questions you're asking. One is securities in the United States. So if you have an ADR, an American Depository Receipt, receipt and you are PetroChina, uh, you, don't have to find, you don't have to submit yourself to a covered audit. It's shocking, but you don't. 
Uh, so, but, but what that means for the layperson is you can just tell people what your financial situation is and they have to believe you. There's correct. no check and balance it's at actually, all. It's actually worse than that. Okay. So there are three levels of ADRs mm -hmm. and depending on which level ADR you, you classify or qualify for, um, you don't, some, some just need to send a, a 20 page glossy presentation with no financials in it. So we have, as a country, have allowed this to happen because the idea was back during various, I'm not going to point fingers, at various administrations, mm -hmm. they thought we need an on-ramp for global emerging markets to access U.S. capital markets and to grow. I understand ideologically the idea, uh, again, the idea behind it. However, we have strict securities compliance in the U.S. for reasons. We've had huge frauds in the past. We've had Enron, WorldCom, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on in companies that actually had audits that were defrauding U.S. shareholders. So we've set high standards and we, Dodd-Frank really brought that to, the Dodd-Frank Act brought that to a, a level that uh, if you and I are going to raise money in the U.S. and run a U.S. company, we're going to have to adhere to some really high standards. Yes. And that's the way it should be. Yes. Um, Chinese companies today get a pass. They don't have to do that. Well, why is that important? Well, because it's tens of billions of dollars on the equity side, and it's a trillion dollars worth of bonds, a trillion today. Now, it's going to, we're talking about this issue with foreign indices and China's participation there. I'm only talking about these are U.S. listed companies. Right. So then when we go to the foreign side, this is hundreds of billions of dollars. And we're funneling hundreds of billions of dollars to companies in China and Hong Kong that don't have, first of all, there's no rule of law over there, as you know. Yes. Imagine as a Westerner what you think you're going to get when something files bankruptcy over there. It rhymes with hero. <laughs> you're not going to get anything, right. right? When things go bad. Well, yeah. So we are allowing and forcing even the U.S. federal retirement thrift plan, the money of our U.S. military, is being forcibly invested in Chinese companies that have no audits. And then some of them that build concentration camps in Xinjiang, in Hikvision that builds all the surveillance equipment for China. It's insane that US military retirement money is helping China with their mission. What amount of American dollars would you say right now through these index funds, through pension funds and so forth is basically in China in a sense and can be held hostage, I guess. It right? is. I mean, what, we're what, never, we're never going to get it back. How, right? how, much money, how much money is it? So by the end, of, I'll give you an answer. By the end of this year, um, we think that number is going to be around $400 billion. So if you just follow the weightings of these various indices, and, and let's say there's strict compliance with the indices, which there always is, mm -hmm. by the end of 2019, it'll be $400 billion. $400 billion. That's, and so, you know, presumably that creates a bunch of leverage. Uh, uh. It creates all <laughs> kinds of problems. I mean, you know, you, yeah. you, I, see, I see your mind working saying I, you can't believe this, but when you think about the leverage that it, that it gives the Chinese, the additional leverage, not to mention the dollars that it gives them, and they'd use those dollars, right, money's fungible, to expand their Belt and Road program, to build their military, because the Chinese need dollars to buy all of these things, right? They need it to buy base metals, they need it to buy basic materials, they need it to buy energy. They have to have dollars to buy all of those things. So we as a country are allowing them to use our own system of asset allocation and investment. And then they also do this fascinating thing where they get guys like Schwartzman and Sheldon Adelson and Steve Wynn and all these billionaires they give them special access to their markets so that they become evangelical in the U.S. You've probably seen in the press recently, Sheldon Adelson keeps calling Trump, saying this trade war is bullshit and you need to stop with the tariffs. Well, Sheldon Adelson's gaming license is up in Macau in the next year. So his give a shit factor is really high. And he's basically lobbying for China in the U.S. Because it's, it, it's his own interest. So China is masterful at using the capitalist system against us. What, what I was thinking when you mentioned, you know, you're thinking is basically a lot of these, you know, American pensioners or U.S. military almost can be effectively become a lobby group, basically, 
for the CCP if all that money is held hostage. It's, right. almo it's almost like, is that, is that or, accurate? Or if That's... the returns are dependent upon uh, China doing well. It's actually, yeah. you don't even have to go to the hostage level. You can say, if 20% of my money is invested in China and I'm already in there, then don't do anything to ruin that, i.e., let's just let China keep doing what it's doing and, and try to grow my money because I can't get my money out, right? Once you're in, it's, it's like the, the Roach Motel, you can't get out. And so it becomes a much, much larger problem. So the good news is, is Senator Rubio, in a, in, a, in a bipartisan group, is now trying to put together the, the Equitable Act that's going right. to require compliance with U.S. securities laws in the U.S. Uh, so Chinese listings in the U.S. are going to be much tougher. Uh, God forbid they have to adhere to the same rules we do. I know, I know that sounds crazy, but, but uh, it's a good start. And then we're also maybe expanding it to uh, using other like uh, U.S. retirement laws uh, to prohibit capital from moving uh, to these other indices. Look, here's an a interesting fun fact, right? It, you saw the Hong Kong Stock Exchange try to buy the London Stock Exchange for $39 billion in a hostile uh, offer. And people were scratching their heads thinking, why would they ever buy? Why would they pay that much for that exchange? Well, the LSE owns the FTSE indices. And China's, China is not included in those indices yet. I so see. China's calculus was simple. We'll pay $39 billion, but we'll get $200 billion back when they include us in the index. Like, this is what's going on today. And for some reason, like, the, the world's not seeing it. Kyle, when you, when you frame it this way, it strikes me almost like the CCP is trying to set up a situation where the U.S. feels like they have to bail out China much as they did the financial system in 2008. Is this, am I going crazy here or? So I see where you're going there and, and I would actually go the other way and, and I would say that the narrative that the people like the Global Times and China Daily and Xinhua and all these various Chinese you know, news and quotes agencies mm -hmm. uh, like to run with is China's, China can outlast Trump in this trade war and you know, if we have President Warren uh, coming in, they're just going to wait him out and they'll get, it, they'll get a deal done. I think, number one, they're gravely mistaken. Uh, number two, what's important about who holds all the cards here, the, the, the narrative that I've been trying to give you when you understand the way their financial system works is their desperate need for dollars. We hold all the cards. And as soon as Trump and our National Security Council and our intelligence agencies realize that we actually hold all the cards and because we control their access to dollars. And if we start requiring China to adhere to our rule of law when they raise dollars from us, it's going to be a real problem for them. And it, it actually throws the stick in the spokes of their whole financial system. So that's the, that's the narrative I want you to walk away from or walk away with today uh, is, is we hold all these cards. And by the way, all we have to do are follow our own laws. I mean, you, all we, we keep talking about defense, right? All we've been talking about is how we defend ourselves from the various attacks of, of China, whether it's the narrative war or the economic war or the uh, cyber war. Right? They're fighting three or four wars against us right now. The only one they're not fighting so far is the kinetic war, and God hope it doesn't go there. Right. Uh, but I think, and that's, as you know, their 100-year plan is to, is to win is to dominate the world without ever firing a shot. And so far, they're doing a, a damn good job of it. But we hold all these cards. And when we realize that, we can start operating in a different way as a country. So we need a whole of government approach to working against the Chinese. You saw FBI Director Ray say that. Uh, right. So I, I, think, I, think it's, uh, I think it's happening. Oh, whole of government. The, there's a lot of people in this country who won't like that formulation or won't like that concept, right? We're, we're, we're a free market uh, place. We, have, we, we, we don't want the government directing our mm. industry and so forth. So that's, that's a great segue into another area that we should be talking about. And when you think about China today and these, these various uh, wars they're fighting that we just, that we just spoke about, uh, when you look at the various constituencies, so when you look at the President of the United States, or you look at the executive branch uh, in his cabinet, 
and you look at the intelligence agencies in the US military, if you read the 2019 Intelligence Authorization Act, which was passed a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. in there they named four countries as hard target countries, hard targets. Yes. China's one of them. Yes. One of four with mm -hmm. right Iran, Venezuela and of it, course, it, it, you know, Russia. So all three of those constituencies regard China as our biggest adversary. And yet there's only one other constituent, constituency in the U.S. that treats them as their best friend and they can't wait to invest another dollar in them and it's Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So just think about the, the differences of opinion between the various constituencies in the U.S. And so you said some people aren't going to like that whole of government approach. Well, what makes China so effective in various areas around the world is they have a plan and they execute that plan. The difference between economics and national security is something that is, that is just, the, that discussion is not had. And no one, no one that runs Apple Computer is in charge of U.S. national security. Right. They don't even, it's not even in their shareholder dossier. Right. Right. It's not in their, it's not in their fiduciary responsibility. Yeah. Nor is it in Nike, nor is it in Walmart. They have huge influence on the president because they can call him up and say, hey, you know, you're really hurting our business. Well, sorry, we might have to hurt your business. So I tend to think national security is more important than the next quarterly report of our public companies. And so at some point in time, we have to have a whole of government approach to our national security. And I think it's starting to happen. So, you know, you mentioned Wall Street, you know, there's that famous quote from Steve Bannon where he says Wall Street effectively is the investment relations arm of the CCP or at least acts that way. Um, that, I've always, that, that feels like an exaggeration, but if that is indeed the case, which is you're alluding to here, um, how can you help change that? Because it's, it's an extremely powerful group pushing in a very different direction, you, you're arguing. So I, I would say that Steve Bannon's quote there, uh, while he can be hyperbolic, that one is spot on. Uh, when you come up here to DC, and you meet with the various constituencies that are underwriting, whether it's legislation or even the administrative fixes that, that some are trying to make in, in various uh, government agencies, um, the primary opponent many times is Wall Street. Because think about it, they're all chasing one thing. They're all chasing El Dorado in China. They can't wait to invest another shekel into the 1.4 billion people and try to earn a profit. And you think about, all the Wall Street firms, they want more M&A, they want more IPOs, they want more capital. And as long as that gate's open and, and they can tell that story about the glories of, of China and the profits that they can make in the future, they want, that to, they want their gravy train to keep running. And so, what, again, whether it's the sell side or even the buy side, you look at the Black Rocks and the Black Stones and the private equity firms, they can't wait to invest more money in China regardless of, again, I'll take us somewhere else, you know, the, the internment of more than a million people. We, U.S. intelligence is three million people in Xinjiang. Um, the, the social unrest we're seeing in Hong Kong, which is going to turn bloody, it's already gotten bloody, right? The, the human rights violations in China are back to the scale of, of the 1920s and 30s, which is absolutely awful. And the, Wall Street just seems to be disconnected. Hollywood's disconnected. It's this fascinating situation today where, again, the various constituencies are all acting in their self-interest. So when we go back to this whole of government idea, you know, this is, this is about greed versus national security. Those, those, those are the two uh, competing notions in the U.S. And, and I think national security should win. Right. And be, because the Chinese Communist Party has been so effective at leveraging let's say the greed side oh, of yeah. capitalism. They're the world's right? best at yeah. bribery and, and you know, direct and indirect bribery. There's no one better than the Chinese. So why don't you give me, give me an example that jumps to your mind around that? So I'll give you a specific company example. So if you, if you look at ZTE, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese telecom giant, uh, you know, we have ZTE and Huawei, I think, are, the, are, are at the nexus of what the U.S. should be most concerned about, mm -hmm. which is, of course, access to information and global domination through the ownership of data. Uh, and, but in ZTE's case, um, you have the issue with that the Commerce Department just settled with them on, which is payments to uh, uh, 
selling equipment to Iran outside of U.S. Uh, US uh, sanctions. But there's something much bigger, deeper, and more worrisome in ZTE. And if you go around and you look at all of the cases of bribery where ZTE execs have bribed uh, African leaders, whether it's the, the, you know, I mean, just, just choose, the, whether it's Uganda, uh, whether it's um, Singapore, whether it's, you name it, they've been bribing world leaders to get their equipment in. And all of these court cases have local uh, documents that you can go pull and read. And you can see that it's not only is it systemic, but it's actually run by Shenzhen, ZTE's headquarters. They, they actually have a chief bribery officer in, in, in ZTE. And so why do we let them operate? Chief bribery officer? Yeah, so a whistleblower came out in, in May of this year uh, and said that every single bribe has to be approved by the board in Shenzhen. Uh, and, and so you see that, that what's going on in, comp the, you know how the Chinese operate, right? The reason we can't compete with the Chinese in Africa uh, is because they bribe everyone to get the contract. So U.S. companies can't, can't do it. They'll, do, they'll operate at a non-economic level to get what they want uh, just from the beginning, and then they'll add a bribe on top of it. So the difference between a level at which the U.S. will do a deal and the level at which China will do a deal is so large that uh, we, we don't get any of the deals done. So when you ask me for a specific example, just start Googling ZTE bribery. And then you'll see also that once their executives get arrested for these bribes and the African leaders get arrested, the Middle East leaders get arrested, what happens? ZTE Inc. bails them out of jail and then they flee. And so there are many of these bribery cases are just open because some of these countries won't, won't convict in absentia. And so, or absentia, and ZTE paid the bribe with ZTE Inc.'s money uh, and paid the bail with ZTE Inc.'s money. So, you know, these things are in broad daylight. This, right. They're not trying to hide it. This is how they operate. And why we let them have their headquarters here in the United States in Richardson, Texas, right where I live, is insane. Okay, so in this trade war, as we say, let's say we put in this legislation that requires uh, all these companies to open their books, I mean, basically, right? And be, adhere to the same rules American companies are. What, what do you foresee happening? I mean, this, this would shake the system as it exists right now to its core, wouldn't it? Yeah, I will, first of all, the Chinese will never open their books. So I just don't think it'll ever happen. <laughs> okay. Right, they've said it won't happen. They've said it's all national secrets. Well, okay, so there you go. So what's, so what's the next play? We have legislation. So we, stop, yeah. so, so we don't let them raise money in the U.S. And we don't allow U.S. retirement dollars to invest in Chinese companies that don't adhere to our laws. Right. That, that would be the trump card in your view here, because now they don't have access to absolutely a very large number amount of U.S. They dollars. They can't operate without our money. So that is just requiring them to adhere to U.S. law would ruin them. With respect to the Hong Kong situation, right? Hong Kong, obviously, the monetary system has been operating independently um, with much more of the kind of checks and balances that that American companies are held to in the U.S. Um, you've been saying... Get Wait, your, I'm yeah. not going to agree with that. Oh, you're not going to agree with that. So, okay. so I would say the HKMA has been fairly transparent. So the, call it the, 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 secure, the, the, the uh, currency administrator okay. uh, operates with a fair amount of transparency. Uh, when you look at uh, H shares uh, listed in Hong Kong, none of them submit to covered audits. Oh, okay. So I would say that they are not operating with transparency and fraud is pervasive throughout Hong Kong. But compared to the mainland, it's been a relatively... Right. It's a taller <laughs> midget than the mainland. <laughs> okay. Yes. No, I, what I mean, I, I, I noticed, I think it was in May that you basically were saying, you know, pull your dollars out of Hong Kong. Yes. And, and so obviously the unrest, obviously, you know, what... The, the plays that the CCP is making to Hong Kong, you know, I suppose validate that, first have validated that perspective since May. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, what is your take on, on, on Hong Kong in the, within the global financial system right now? So Hong Kong is the place, it's the nexus of where uh, China raises a lot of its dollars. So if you look at the, at the Hang Seng Index, 
85% of the companies on the Hang Seng Index are actually Chinese companies. Okay. So you need to think about Hong Kong as the little city uh, that is the dollar conduit for China. Okay. It's their golden goose. Uh, but China hasn't been able to help themselves with overreaching their authority uh, with the extradition bill, which, as you know, was first proposed in, in February. Yes. yes. And so what you're seeing happen in Hong Kong is actually the Communist Party's worst nightmare. And, and what I mean by that is, is domestically, where the, where the Chinese control the narrative and they have it locked down and they don't have, uh, uh, they can also close the internet, so they don't have pictures circulating of all of the horrible things they do to people that are non-compliant with uh, the CCP's rules and regulations. Right. Um, Hong Kong is the exact opposite, right? It's uh, seven and a half million people that are used to freedoms and a British slash Western rule of law. Uh, that's why it's thrived so so much or so well over the over the last call it twenty years. And so now you're seeing the evolution of again the CCP's worst nightmare. So we're heading into October first, the seventieth anniversary of the Communist Party. Between today and October first, you're going to see some real bloodshed in Hong Kong because. CCP is not going to go for protests going into their 70 year, 70 year celebration and military parade. And so unfortunately, you're going to see things worsen. But again, Hong Kong is two issues. One is the extradition issue, China's overreach. The other is actually their financial system. It's a 36 year rigid financial arrangement in an economy that's very dynamic. They are the most levered Western economy in the world. Okay. They're, they're as levered as the worst European country was going into 2011. Like Iceland or something? Yeah, like their Hong banks Kong. are nine times their GDP in Hong Kong. Iceland, Ireland, Cyprus, they were all nine and ten times GDP, and those dominoes fell very quickly. So if you have a, if you have a swoon in the Hong Kong property markets, which in, invariably is, is actually happening right now, uh, the, the, ch the banks in Hong Kong are going to have a real, real hard time with this one. So this is, this is another... I don't know, is it an ace in the hole in the trade war on the American side, or how do you see that? So it's interesting. President Trump seems to think Hong Kong's an internal problem and that they're going to solve it. But again, as we sit here today, just yesterday, both the House and the Senate passed the Hong Kong Human Rights right. uh, Act. Uh, and that basically puts the, uh, puts the spotlight a little more on, on the determination of the autonomy uh, of Hong Kong. And I think that what's happening there is Congress is trying to take that decision out of the president's hands. As the, the 1992 Hong Kong Policy Act works with the United States uh, between the U.S. and Hong Kong, is the State Department is to write a report once a year to the president. And the president, in his sole determination, determines whether or not Hong Kong is sufficiently autonomous. And now what you have is, is Congress almost preempting the president and saying, we're going to make that determination for you, Mr. President. So. Uh, I think you're starting to see, I think you're starting to see America wake up to the problems in China. I think you think uh, America is definitely waking up to the issues in Hong Kong. As you saw recently, we just held hearings with some of the Hong Kong pro-democracy uh, uh, folks that were, you know, Josh Wong and the rest of, Denise Ho and the rest of them. And, and I think that was a, it was a, it was a phenomenal hearing. So I think we're waking up to these problems. But I actually think we have a lot more waking up to do to understand what China's end game is here. Okay, Kyle. So, what is this waking up that we need to we need to have in your view here in America? I think you know it's not because I live in this world of investment, but I think the thing that's keeping the key, the thing that's keeping the blood flowing to the tumor is U.S. investment capital. We're funding China's entire ascendancy, right? Their geopolitical assertiveness. Their, uh, their military assertiveness, their economic assertiveness is all rooted in this fact that they've built a system that they think is better than ours, and theirs is built on a house of cards. It's just built, it's a foundation of sand. And the sand is U.S. dollars. And so we have to stop blindly investing U.S. dollars in Chinese companies. And the waking up that needs to happen is Wall Street needs to wake up to the national security implications and the fiduciary problems with investing money in China. Kyle, with respect to the trade war, mm -hmm. do you foresee a deal happening before the 2020 election? So, you know, we call it the trade war, 
I think uh, China's been fighting this war against us since 2001, and we just figured it out. For the first time ever, we have uh, a president that's willing to push back and fight back, which is the, a great thing for our country. I'll start there. Um, as far as do we see a deal between now and uh, 20, the, the November 2020 election, it's too hard to handicap what President Trump's going to do, uh, because as you know with him, every day he wakes up is a new day. Uh, if you talk to his various uh, constituents in his cabinet, you talk to the people in the Security Council, you talk to the people in, in uh, commerce, and, and uh, you understand what Trade Rep Lighthizer's real ambitions are. Uh, if it's up to the people advising the president, we won't sign anything that isn't measurable and enforceable. Those, those two components of a deal have to be part of the deal. If you remember when we were just about to get this landmark deal done, yes. and uh, we had a 152-page trade deal and we were ready to sign it. And overnight, the Chinese pulled the 50 core pages out and left it 102 pages and said, we'll sign it now. They took out anything that was measurable and enforceable the night before. Right. So I don't see the Chinese giving in, and I know our people won't give in either, but I have no idea how to handicap the president. That's very interesting. And But effectively, you're saying from, what, from our interview today that they will never allow that openness and no it's antithetical to the communist party they will never sign something that's unilaterally enforceable against them they will not do it so when people talk about this being a trade war it's actually so much bigger than that mm -hmm. this is it's finally the clash of cultures it's the clash of two civilizations that don't operate in the same manner and we're requiring it because we're tired of them reneging on every single deal they sign with us Pre uh, uh, Lighthizer our trade rep has, has a folio of every promise they've made to us that they haven't kept. And it's multiple pages long. So we're looking at Western capitalist culture and Chinese communist or communism with Chinese characteristics culture. It's almost like you're saying that with communism may, being maintained in China, there, there isn't a hope for a reasonable cooperation. I think that's fair to say. I think it's, it's rule of law versus rule by law. Uh, and that's, those are the two cultures that are, that are clashing today. And I think that, um, I, I think that as we go forward, in the, in the past, we've given them a past. We've, we've, we've invested in hope. And uh, we've also allowed our leadership to be um, influenced with CCP money. And now that hope is gone, and now we are, we are now woke to their uh, MO, their ideology, and what their real plan is for the next, call it between now and 2049. And so I don't think we're ever going to sign something with them that isn't measure and measurable and enforceable and, and ruled by a law. And I don't think they're ever going to sign anything that requires those, those things. So I, I, I don't see it happening now. You ask, you know, again, we're, this is up to President Trump between now and November 2020. President Trump runs each day as a new day. Uh, and so he himself could unilaterally do something that may be very detrimental to the long-term national security of the United States in an effort to make the market go up that day. That's what I worry about. And uh, so actually, you know, to, to that point, I was uh, speaking with Steve Moore recently, and he was talking about this idea of an interim deal, right? Look, I know Steve Moore and Art Laffer and all of these economists, they believe that we should get an interim deal. We should make the stock market go up 5,000 points. Just to, They're so focused on getting a Republican or, more importantly, getting Trump reelected for another four years. I am much more apolitical than that. I, carry, I care very much about our national security. Whether we have President Trump or Elizabeth Warren, I will never change my tune. Um, so I'm trying to give you an objective analysis of the MO of our biggest adversary, China, without trying to politicize it. But if, like I say, if you, what I'm trying to tell you is you can't handicap Trump. Okay. So given all of these realities, Kyle, that we just, that we just discussed, what is the best case scenario for the U.S.? Uh, so I think the best case scenario is for us to have a slight recession next year disallow Chinese companies from listing in the U.S. until they adhere to our laws and stop the flow of capital from U.S. retirement funds, U.S. endowments, pensions uh, into 
these global indices and invest more in the U.S. The, our best case scenario is to take a little bit of medicine today uh, so that we live longer in the future. Um, and I know that prescription doesn't sound like it's a great one, but if those are your two options, then, then I choose option A. Kyle Bass, such a pleasure to have you. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here.